morning. Hey, hi. Jeff? Hey. This is the indigenous woman piece that we've put together for the uh, legendary new reporter show, which is the rest of it's upstairs. Uh, this is the last piece of one show. The show will be up until December. So uh, you got a great chance to come see it as many times as you want. If you happen to be a, a native new reporter, you should know some of these people that existed in the past and how significant this place is and how many significant people came from here who formed not only the government that we serve under, but the industries that surrounded the whole area during the 18th century. Anyway, uh, this piece here, I worked in conjunction with Christine. She is an incredible historian. Uh, Christine Alpica was uh, assigned or volunteered to help me with this piece, and uh, her input into it would make it remarkable in my mind, uh, and that I would not have done anywhere near what it represents today. And we will talk a little bit about what's here and what it represents, and we'll let her start out because she's the historian. Thank you, Jeff. It's been such a fun project and also an honor to work with an artist of your caliber on this incredible piece that honors Native women and children today and in our past. You mentioned Native Noob reporters. Well, the true Native Noob reporters, of course, were the indigenous peoples that once inhabited the land. And as a public historian and an ally, I don't speak for Native people, but I do try to work on projects that help center Native voices and experiences today as well as historically. And before I start any talk or program, I'd like to give a land acknowledgement statement, which I feel is very important to help uplift the Native experience and history. So this museum, the Custom House Maritime Museum, is located in the Wabanakik, Dawn Land, inhabited by indigenous peoples for over 10,000 years. We are in Nadakina, the traditional homelands of the Pawtucket Band of the Penacook Abenaki people, who lived, fished, farmed, hunted, and gathered along the banks of the Malakme, Molodamak, which is Abenaki for Merrimack, or Deep River, which is right behind us. We acknowledge and honor with respect and gratitude the land, Aki, water, Nebi, flora, Olawikia, fauna, Awasak, and people, Alnobak, past and present, who have stewarded Nadakina for thousands of generations and have ongoing cultural and historical connections to these lands and waterways. We make this acknowledgement aware of continual violations of water, territorial rights, and sacred sites in these and other indigenous homelands. And I'm so pleased that the Custom House Maritime Museum and Jeff chose to represent an indigenous figure in our town's history. And maybe you could talk a little bit, Jeff, about how you came to this concept of the woman and child. Well, we actually started out with the indigenous idea of celebrating a man instead of a woman. And she gave me a whole bunch of information about the land transfer that happened here in the early uh, 1700s. And uh, then this man that was connected to the land transfer and his activities. And it, for me, it didn't really talk about what the indigenous people were actually had gone through and were going through uh, at, in the time period and, and before. Uh, so I kept thinking about it and saying, well, you really need to have something else that says more. And 
the word or the, the word that came into mind was survivance over and over again in my mind that uh, these people struggled to push forward their culture and their next generation uh, through terrible odds that were inflicted on them put that way. And so this image came into my mind of a woman pushing forward her child against all odds that was a symbol of this it determines to continue under whatever circumstances you've lived in. And I later learned that this word survivance is actually a word. I looked it up in the dictionary and it was, it, it does exist in the dictionary, but it was a little vague as to what it was. And she explained to me what it was afterwards. <laughs> Yes, it's important to unpack this term because it's one that not many people are familiar with. It was coined by a contemporary Anishinaabe Ojibwe scholar, Gerald Visner. And the word survivance has the word survival within it, but it's not merely survival. It is a resistance to adverse situations and adaptive resiliency in the face of great challenge and adversity persistence and resistance, and also it repudiates the idea of Native people simply as victims, and it endows them with agency and um, their own will to continue on and adapt to challenging circumstances of settler colonialism, which as we know still exists today in many forms of land dispossession, um, the taking of children from homes, and many other forms of environmental degradation that Native peoples face all over the world today still. So this idea of survivance, we wanted to um, include in this sculpture to really recognize the creative resiliency of women, indigenous women past and present everywhere. And so I just love what you um, came up with, Jeff, with the concept of the child being held because this really symbolizes also hope for the future and the idea that Native peoples are still here, and they will be here, of course, in the future. And um, uh, Sung Squaw is another term that we should probably unpack a little bit. Um, many of you are familiar with the term squaw as a derogatory term. And you would never use squaw by itself in a sentence to describe a Native woman. It would be a derogatory term. However, Sung Squaw, as you can see on the poster there, it's spelled differently. It's an Algonquin term, and it's actually an honorific term, and it means a woman leader. Uh, so it's, it's used to um, honor and to designate a woman in a position of power. And there are historical examples that we have of leaders, including the Sunk Squaw of Misitek, or Squaw Sachem, as she's known in colonial records. She lived in the early to late 1600s, and she was one of the first to have interactions with the colonial English government under John Winthrop and his associates. And she also enacted some of the earliest and first deeds between the English settler colonists and the native peoples, including the land that Harvard University sits on and lands all the way up to the area of Salem and Beverly, which was known as Nomkeg. And so we wanted to kind of use this historical figure to also represent the woman leader in this position of power. And in the 17th century, as we know, colonial women did not have much power in their society. So for people to even know that women, um, Native women, could be leaders is a very important piece of our learning and unlearning process. So. I'd love to hear more about your process, Jeff, and how you worked on some of the cultural design elements and, and this beautiful statue. Well, with your help, we learned that wampum was very important. And maybe you should unpack that for us <laughs> first before we go any farther. And why there's so much wampum on this piece? OK, sure. Well, we actually have some wampum right here. <laughs> that I uh, recently collected off the beach in uh, the Cape. And wampum is whelk or quahog shell. 
that was gathered and worked by indigenous peoples for countless generations. And um, it was used as a form of communication. Uh, many people have heard of wampum belts, and this is actually what you see draped around the arms of the Sung Squaw survivants here. And these were used to communicate important messages. Often they were used in diplomatic uh, negotiations, both between tribes and nations, as well as between indigenous peoples and colonial settlers. Um, many people have heard of wampum belts with the Haudenosaunee a little further to our west, but they were also used primarily by peoples in the eastern woodlands, and they were used as a form of communication, diplomacy, and reciprocity. So it was always in a relational uh, situation that native people would use wampum. Later, the colonists actually took and appropriated the idea of wampum to use as a form of currency. At one point, you could pay for your Harvard education in wampum, believe it or not. <laughs> and uh, so it also became something that was appropriated by the Dutch and other colonial powers. The Dutch, for some time, even manufactured wampum themselves and started to use it as a form of currency. So it, it, um, it changed over time from being a, a more strictly indigenous form to a cross-cultural way of interaction and negotiation. So that's wampum in a nutshell, and well, you, Jeff did you, a remarkable you job. Out, you left out one piece, oh, okay. and that's uh, that the wampum was like a contract. It's like exchanging a, a contract between a contract we would have today that's written on paper would be exchange this piece of wampum with uh, what you agreed with, and that, that was the contract. Uh, so if you have a society that has unwritten, uh, doesn't have word written ability, then it's very logical that you would be using something uh, to uh, certify an agreement. So tell us about um, what you did here with the wampum uh, belt and her beautiful uh, shawl here. Well, frankly, when you started talking about a wampum belt, it wasn't part of this design. And I didn't know quite what to do with it because uh, what do you do with a, something that wraps around somebody and around everything else uh, and still hold the emphasis of the design itself, which is this upper lifting of the child. So I got worked in my mind that maybe the wampum should be wrapped around the arms of the woman. That would emphasize the, the belt and at the same time maybe emphasize the motion. Um, so that's, that's how that ended up there. It wasn't, uh, originally we were going to put it on the base and it didn't it didn't say enough to me that you would have this thing laying on the base. It didn't, it didn't make sense to me. And there's more wampum here too. There's uh, <laughs> multiple necklaces on her breast and uh, elaborate earrings and everything else. Uh, the idea here is that when you were a leader of the society, that in it insignia that you were a leader, that you had lots of wampum, just like uh, present day people have lots of money in their leaders, you know, same idea. And, uh, yeah. well, is, and do you want to talk a little bit about Well, you tell me about that, <laughs> I'll show this. Okay, yeah, well, we'll tell the story about that in a moment because it <laughs> relates to this. Um, so around her, her skirt here, her dress, there's a very important cultural design element as well, which we took from research both ethnographically and contemporarily. Um, Native peoples, the Wabanaki peoples of the Dawnland still use this symbol today. And it is um, a little hard to see from where you're standing, but we can zoom in perhaps. It's a double loop wisdom curl. And it has these half circles that are connected in the center with a little flower, and that is a tobacco flower. And tobacco was a sacred medicinal plant, and it represented both the struggle and the survival. So again, it's related to this idea of survivance. And the, the loops are part of the road of life, 
challenges that we face on the road of life and the sacred medicine that helps us to get through those challenges. And he's holding up the sticker. Coincidentally, when I went down to um, the Mashpee Wampanoag um, homeland this last weekend where I found some wampum on the beach, I also found this sticker by a contemporary artist, Sierra Henrys, who also designed a beautiful uh, logo for our Indigenous Peoples Day here in Newburyport, posters that we're using. And I was just uh, amazed that that exact symbol that we chose for the skirt is still being very well represented um, even in stickers today. And so I gave one to Jeff so he can, he can wear his wisdom curl with pride. <laughs> He's earned it. Um, I'd love to hear more about the process of making her, too, the statue itself. Well, the piece itself is made in uh, oil-based uh, medium density clay. Medium density means that it's rather hot, or it hardens up a little bit while you're working on it so it stays uh, uh, permanent. And then uh, when it's done, uh, then there's a mold made of it. There's a rubber mold made, and then a mother mold on the outside which holds the rubber in place while you cast it. So then it's cast in a resin material, and then other finish, the finished process begins, uh, all the stuff that didn't come out of the mold or all the seam lines and everything else is fixed and then she's uh, painted with a, a bronze uh, silver paint and then patinaed with a brown paint to bring out the details. It's beautiful. And there's also a couple of other elements here that we should point out. Um, the medicine bag that she wears here, um, it has some um, porcupine quills and that was another um, uh, element and material that Native peoples used for their um, jewelry and their decoration. And we know that this particular medicine bag comes from a design from a medicine bag that was found close to here on Indian Hill in what's today West Newbury. You alluded earlier to a man who did a land exchange. That was Great Tom. That's the only way that we know him in the records. And in 1650, he actually sold his fenced fields at Indian Hill in West Newbury to the proprietors of Newbury. Unfortunately, he probably became indentured to the proprietors at that time. But on Indian Hill, we know that there was a settlement of Native people, and this medicine bag, or the likeness of it, was found. So we decided to copy the elements of that with the porcupine uh, quills. And there's also the base, which, do you want to talk about that? Well, uh, three sisters terminology come to me, and I did what? Three sisters, what the heck is that? <laughs> uh, you have to understand, I'm on a big learning curve like the rest of you out there when it comes to the subject matter. Anyway, it's the three primary uh, uh, vegetables that were grown by the indigenous people, raised and cultivated here as their primary, one of their primary food sources. And it's called the Three Sisters, which is corn, uh, beans, and squash. So this base is made of those images. It's a repeated base of four, four repeats. Uh, so that means that one piece was made uh, in clay, and then it was cast in plaster, then it was reworked. Another mold was made, a production mold was made of, each of the piece, and then a cast would be done of the, in the production mold and then forecasts would be done of it and put together with one piece. So that, if you look at it, you can see it repetitive around the outside edge. So this is another thing that we or insisted that we must have. Okay. Yes, it's, it's really it's gorgeous. And um, the idea of the corn, beans, and squash also relates to the idea of survivance, right? Because it's another reciprocal relationship between these plants. Um, the three sisters, corn, beans, and squash, worked together symbiotically to feed the people and nourish them. The corn has the stalk. The beans wrap around the stalk and provide nitrogen back into the soil. And the squash blossoms help to provide shade for the mounds, they, they planted in mounds. So they would mound up the dirt and then plant these three together. 
So it worked, they work together in harmony and help um, the people to survive. And the earliest accounts that we have from Champlain and John Smith and others all talk about the native fields that were cultivated. So there's a myth often that is um, put forth that this was an empty wilderness, vacant land with you know savage people who didn't farm. And that's completely false. And we know that even from the earliest um, colonists who reported that there were beautiful fields of um, cultivated uh, crops and trees and other plants. So um, we wanted to make sure that we have her kind of supported, really. She's resting and supported on this base of the Three Sisters, which is very symbolic, I think. And you've just done an absolutely beautiful job with it all. The, the thing that got me the most about learning about history of indigenous people was that the first whites may, might have come here in about 1606. By 60, and the estimates were that in that time period, there might have been as many as 10,000 people in the region between Boston and the Merrimack. By 1640, there was only a few hundred left. And when you think about that, if that happened to our culture, it would be devastating. You know, we just went through a pandemic and we're threatened by that. But can you imagine that you're lost 99% of your population, you know, and all of your strength, all of your ability to withstand this onslaught of people claiming your land, taking everything from you. It just is amazing to me that uh, anything exists at all. Yeah. And, you know, even before 1606, um, we know that the French were trading up in Canada with the natives there since the 1500s, the Bosques were also here fishing off the Grand Banks and trading. Mm -hmm. And some of these earliest explorers, quote unquote, were also not just trading, but they were taking native peoples as slaves. So Captain Thomas Hunt, who came from John Smith's company and broke off uh, down in the Cape, he was the first to capture dozens of native people and sell them into foreign servitude. So the people had experience with um, colonists coming and white people coming long before they actually settled here, came on the, the Mayflower in 1620 or the Arbella in 1630. And also those early interactions brought the disease. The first plague was known as the Great Dying. It came between 1616 and 1619. Still debate about what it was. Uh, Leptospirosis is one of the most current theories about it. Uh, also, hepatitis is another possibility. People turned yellow, and that had to do with liver disorders. So um, there's still some debate. But this is before people were even settling here. So we know that these early trades and interactions had a deleterious effect on the native peoples long before there were actually colonists living here or on the Merrimack River. And there was also intertribal war, um, something called the Tarentine Wars by the French, another derogatory term. It was the northern groups that did not have the same agricultural capabilities. There was a certain latitude above which corn really wouldn't grow. So when you got south of this line, people often uh, came down to raid to get corn and other things that they could not get in the northern parts. Um, so by the time the first uh, native uh, and colonial interactions with settlers here came, there were decimation on, on a great scale. And this is before the plagues of the 1630s, which were smallpox. So a lot of um, survivance of the people. It is also a myth, though, to say that everyone was wiped out by these diseases. There was quite a bit of survival, and there were many other factors as to why uh, the populations deteriorated over time through settler colonial impacts on their lands, their waters, and their life ways. Um, but the statue itself is a tribute and testament to the ongoing resiliency and survivance of Native people, 
and um, they've just done an incredible job in honoring that job. And the other factor uh, that you just briefly mentioned, but basically the continent was in a form of war, mostly by native people, uh, stimulated by the French and the English from the early 16th century right into the 18th century. And what that did basically is uh, destroy a lot of the manhood of the indigenous people because they were used as the army on most of these conflicts. So that only left the women to take care of the situation. So this is uh, an example of a leadership that came out of the female side uh, under circumstances that were absolutely necessary. Thank you for adding that. Absolutely. And women are often the victims and children of, of war and violence in all societies and cultures. And so I think, again, choosing the woman and child and the hope for the future um, is an important theme that resonates today. So, great job. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if people have questions or. Wanna... Yes. Jeff. Yeah. How long does this undertaking take you? Uh, a period of time? A couple of months at least. Yeah, and yeah. do you, then you phone it out to a family or do oh, you? No. Or no. you do the whole process? No, for I you? can't afford to take it to a foundry. Okay, this is so you do an A completely to Z. A gift to whoever wants it. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I can't, I can't afford to do that. It's just my time. So the undermine is a the clay that hardens? Yeah. Is that what I understand? Well, it doesn't harden, it gets firm. It's oh, not right. a soft clay. And then you're able to yeah. use your tools to yeah. bring out the detail. If you go upstairs, you'll see a demonstration of that. Oh, okay. And, uh, uh, Thank there's you. a video and some other uh, oh, things to show you the process of what that comes from. Yeah. So you have a full workshop, so to speak. Oh, a studio, yeah. Studio, yeah. Engineer to do this kind of work. Yeah. Well, Quite terrific studio. job. It's a beautiful statue and sculpture. Well, make sure and check out the stuff upstairs. I'm going to. Yes, yeah. please, everyone, go up to see I'm the rest totally of the honest. legendary Newbert Porter's exhibit. Is what it's called, and um, it's it's really exquisite. So now, Does yeah, anyone, excuse oh. me. Will that remain here? Yeah, it's going upstairs, uh, you know, whenever we get done here and uh, be part of the show. So it'll be permanent? Well, I don't know about permanent. It's, no. it's up until December. Oh, okay. We don't know what's happening now. And then what are your plans if it doesn't materialize after that? I don't know. Well, we're hoping that the sculpture will also come to Indigenous Peoples Day in Newburyport. Oh, and yeah. Travel, travel around, right? She's going on the road. Yeah, you, you're, <laughs> you're going to travel for me. <laughs> <laughs> so going on a tour. Yeah. <laughs> <That's right. laughs>